So after uh, after the end of the program, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dua Sharaf. Uh, she is a consultant of radiology here at Urology and Nephro Center, and she will discuss with us the value of ultrasound in nephrology. And I know, and this is our practice, ultrasound is a must. I cannot say ultrasound is a tool for investigating kidneys. It is a complementary clinical examination. So examination of kidneys in the current medicine is by ultrasound. Because if the kidney size is normal, as physicians, we cannot palpate kidneys, except lower pool of thin female in deep inspiration. That is quack. So examination of kidney is principally by ultrasound. And we cannot say examination in nephrology is complete, except after looking at the kidneys by ultrasound. Since more than a decade, we have training here in the outpatient clinic to look at the kidneys by ultrasound. Even if we have, if we are suspicious, it is spleen or left kidney, just about the probe, you will find it is kidney, it's okay kidney. If there is a mass and you are suspecting large kidneys, you put a probe in, in part of a second, we can say it is large kidney. If they're hydronephrosis, the probe can tell us. So this is, and this is, as we mentioned before, the point of care ultrasound. The details of ultrasound and the value of ultrasound, I'm sure that we will have a very nice idea from Dr. Dua Sharaf, the consultant of radiology at the Rural Nephro Center, and we are going forward to start her presentation uh, now. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Dua Sharaf. So I make the pointer red color. This is because you requested this. Just a second. This is the spotlight. It is red color. So it is because Dr. Dua is very fine. So we select the best environment. Yes, that's it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today we Good afternoon. Today we will talk about renal ultrasonography and nephrology. We have to put in our minds the importance of the kidney. According to this, say, bones can break, muscles can atrophy, glands can loop about, and even brain can sleep without immediate danger to survival. But when the kidneys fail, neither bone, muscle, glands, or nor brain thoughts carry on. Today, we will have the importance of clinical indications for performing of renal ultrasonography as the approach to perform the appropriate ultrasound study, normal anatomy of the kidneys, normal variant, abnormal finding, and clinical impact. Protocol of ultrasonography, we have to scan both kidneys, urinary bladder, residual volume, aorta, and if we need their additional local protocol. Ultrasonography done in suspected renal colic. If there is colicky flank pain radiating to the groin, if there is hematuria, or during routine investigations for other systems. To answer two important questions, if the presence of parenchymal disorders or presence of hydronephrosis. No need for patient preparation before ultrasonography study. 
we use transducer of 3 megahertz or 3.5. In very thin patients, we have to use 5 megahertz probe. Patient positioning, we, uh, use, uh, we make the patient in the supine position, uh, posterior oblique, lateral decapitus, and prone position. Kidneys are retrocutaneal organs, opposite thoracic 12 up to down to uh, fourth lumbar vertebrae. Right kidney is lower than the left kidney. Right kidney is posterior inferior to the liver and dual bladder. Left kidney is inferior and medial to the spleen. Arterial supply, the renal artery arises from the aorta directly and venous drainage drains into IVC also directly. Adrenal glands are superior, anterior, medial to each kidney. Here, on the right side, there is the liver, right kidney, right suprarenal gland, renal artery, and renal vein. On the left side, there is a spleen, left kidney, left suprarenal gland, and left renal vein, left renal artery. Left renal artery and the left renal vein. How to do renal ultrasonography approach. The patient is in the supine position and here we will put the probe anteriorly in the subcostal area. Then in the mid axillary line and down in the mid axillary line also. To scan the left kidney we do scanning in the posterior axillary line. So this is approach to the scanning on the right kidney, scanning approach anterior, lateral, posterior, and use the liver as acoustic window. But on the left side it requires posterior approach because the kidney is more posterior to the spleen and there is air filled power which impedes the anterior scanning. Here we put uh, the probe in the right lower intercostal space in the mid axillary line to scan the right kidney to obtain longitudinal scan. Longitudinal scan means that uh, that is anterior orientation and here posterior orientation. Here is uh, superior orientation and here is uh, inferior orientation. It means that is the upper pole of the right kidney and there is diaphragmatic crust and there is a liver as a caustic window. If we need to scan right kidney in the TS scan, we put the probe in the mid axillary line in the intercostal space, then in the lower subcostal to be the orientations here this is anterior orientation this is posterior this is right and this is left this is the kidney in the TS scan kidney in the TS scan and he, this is right kidney because that is the liver and gold bladder is here okay and here is the renal aorta, uh, uh, renal, uh, renal artery, aorta, and IVC, and this is the vertebral body. Vertebral body appears here of hypocaust. If we need to scan the left kidney in the longitudinal uh, axis, we will put the probe in the posterior axillary line. And our orientation here is anterior, here is posterior, this is superior, and this is inferior also. This is a spleen, kidney, left kidney, and there are rib shadows. So we do the scanning of the left kidney in the posterior axillary line in the intercostal space. In the lower intercostal space, we do the TS scanning of the left kidney to the, obtain our orientations. Here is the anterior, this is posterior orientation, this is right, and this is left. 
this is the left kidney, and this is the spleen, and there is the liver. Kidneys length about 9 to 12 centimeter, width about 4 to 5 centimeter, thickness 3 to 4 centimeter. Gerotus fascia encloses the kidney capsule, perinephric fat sinus, which contains the hilum. Hilum contains vessels, nerves, lymphatics, and ureter. Pelvis, uh, there is major and minor calyces. Parenchyma surrounds the renal sinus, which formed of cortex side of the urine formation and contains the functional unit of the kidney, which is called the nephrons. Medulla contains pyramids that pass the urine to the minor calyces column of retinue will separate these pyramids. Here is the diagram which explains the normal kidney anatomy. This is the renal cortex, then renal parenchyma, K. Here is the major, this is the renal pyramid. Here is the minor calyces. Here is major calyces, then the renal pelvis, then the ureter. This is sinus fat, which includes the pelvic LCL system, renal artery, renal vein. Capsule is a smooth and echogenic. Cortex is mid grayless, echogenic than the liver or spleen. Medullary pyramids are hypoechoic. Renal sinus fat is echogenic due to fat content. Renal pelvis is flat when visible. The main renal artery obtains a triphasic wave on the Doppler ultrasound. Main renal vein is monophasic. Mm -hmm. This is longitudinal scan of the right kidney using the liver as a caustic window. Here we obtain that the echogenicity of the right kidney is similar to the liver, which is normal. This is TS scan of the same right kidney, which revealed that the right renal vein drains into the IVC. This is a longitudinal scan of the left kidney using the spleen as a caustic window. So the echogenicity of the left kidney is similar to the spleen, which means that is normal. And here also, this arrow shows this is the renal cortex, okay, lie between the echogenic line, which is called the renal capsule, and hypoechoic triangular area or spaces, which is called renal pyramid and located in the renal middle. On color Doppler ultrasonography, there is a normal perfusion of the intrarenal kidney, intrarenal renal vasculatures, and here is T on the TS scan, we re revealed renal artery and renal vein. Then on the power Doppler, there is the main renal artery of, as the hilum of the kidney is of the sharp systole, low resistance, and the good end of the diastolic flow. This spectrum uh, is called the triphasic wave. And also, we can obtain the monophasic wave of adjacent renal vein below the phase or line. Okay. Ureters are normally not seen. When the bladder is distended with urine, the walls are thin, regular, and hyperechoic. Bladder volume calculated according to the formula length by width by epidemper 0.56. The ureteric orifices can be demonstrated in the transverse section as a bladder phase. Ureteric jets can easily be demonstrated in frequency normal in between 1.5 up to 12.4 times per minute. This is a longitudinal scan of the urinary bladder, which revealed a regular second bladder wall, and here uh, we calculate the bladder volume by multiplying uh, the three dimensions as we mentioned before. Here is distance uh, 10.5, distance 2, 5.5, and distance 3, 10.8 centimeters. So the volume is uh, about 331 milli of urine. In the TS scan, we reveal the irregularity of the bladder wall. And on the color Doppler, it uh, shows the ureteric jet at post ureteric orifices. Common pitfalls in the renal scan failure to scan post kidneys, mistake for prominent renal pyramids for hydronephrosis, mistake prominent pyramids for cysts, confu confusing normal renal arteries for the ureter. Failure to scan through the bladder to search for the stone at the retrovesical junction. Inability to visualize left kidney due to the anterior pro placement. 
for failure to scan the aorta in the suspected renal colic. About the normal variant of the kidneys, uh, first we will talk about persistent fetal oculation, which means indentations on the surface of the kidney, forming a fetal oculation, which may persist in the adulthood. Dromedary hump, and dromedary hump means lateral kidney bulge of the same ecogenicity as the renal cortex. Hypertrophied column of Purkini, which means cortical tissue in dense the renal sinus medially. And hilar lips, uh, which means cortical tissue in dense the renal sinus uh, related to the upper and lower folds. And here is diagrams which uh, show the fetal loculation in A in the At P, we show here dormitory hump. Here, there is a hypertrophied column of Purkini. And lastly, we show hilar lips at the upper and lower folds of the kidney. This is longitudinal scan of the right kidney because it is related to the liver. And it means a regular outline of the kidney, which means persistent fetal oculation. Another case of the right kidney, longitudinal scan of the right kidney uh, related to the liver and shows focal bulge at the mid zone of the right uh, kidney, which means dormitory hum. Here is the color doubler of the uh, kidney, which shows normal vasculatures of the dormitory hum, the same as the kidney. And this is hypertrophied column of Purkini in between the sinus face. Normal variant, first we talk about renal agenesis, which means the failure of the ureteric bud to reach the metanephrus, occurs with vectoral syndrome. Vectoral syndromes consist of vertebral, anorectal, cardiovascular, tracheal, esophageal, renal, and lymph malformation. Here, there is the liver, and uh, there is a low-lying right suprarenal gland. There is no kidney, and there is low position of the right suprarenal gland because of the absence of the right kidney. Second variant, we will talk about double collecting system. A double collecting system, it is uh, difficult to be diagnosed on ultrasonography if there is no hydronephrosis. But if uh, there is hydronephrosis in one or both moieties, it is more easier to be diagnosed with ultrasound. There are two separate collecting systems and duplex ureters, complete or incomplete. Upper moiety mostly with urethroceal and the lower moiety mostly associated with bisicurator reflux. Here we uh, here, there is longitudinal scan of the kidney, which consists of the upper moiety with hydronephrosis and the lower moiety with mild degree of hydronephrosis. Uh, so we, uh, when we observe the hydronephrosis in the upper moiety, we will check about the presence of the erythrocele related to the bladder, and it is present. And this is the dilated ureter related to the moiety of hydronephrosis. Third one, horseshoe kidney. Kidneys are connected usually at the lower pool of the post kidneys. And renal ectopia, which means uh, one or post kidney is present outside the normal renal fossa, cross the fused kidney, which means one kidney attached to the lower pool of the other kidney. Here is the TS scan of, uh, as a midline, which revealed the connection and uh, of the post lower folds of the post kidney in front of the aorta and the vertebral column at the midline. This is called isthmus of the horseshoe kidney. Uh, this is coronal section in the horseshoe kidney, which revealed that is the right compartment and left compartment. Here is the aorta IVC, and the post lower loops are connected in front of the vessels at the midline. This is dense scan of the horseshoe kidney, which uh, revealed normal uptake by the left compartment and reduced the uptake by the right compartment of the horseshoe kidney. Of ectopic kidney, here we will uh, notice that the right kidney is present beside the bladder, and it uh, means that the right kidney is present in the pelvic region, uh, outside the normal renal fossa at the lumbar region. Uh, in the TS scan, here is the right kidney, here is the uterus, and there is a plug. But in the cross diffused ectopia, we notice that the kidney is attached to the lower pool of another kidney at the same side and may uh, misinterpreting as a very large organ. 
Extrarenal pelvis is uh, means a projection outside the kidney medial to the renal sinus, but it is best seen in the TS scan as the renal hilum. It is important to differentiate it from the dilated pelvic LCL system, parapelvic cyst, or the collection. There is longitudinal scan of the kidney, and here is extrarenal pelvis. Okay, uh, in the TS scan, also there is a baggie of renal pelvis outside the kidney, which means extra renal pelvis. Extra renal pelvis uh, should be uh, differentiated from the pelvirital junction obstruction, which is defined as obstruction of outflow of the urine from renal pelvis to the proximal ureter, maybe due to intrinsic, extrinsic causes, or even crossing vessel, should do direct crinography to assess the renal function if this kidney is obstructed or not, because not every dilated system means obstructed kidney. Here is longitudinal grayscale ultrasound of the right kidney, which may, uh, show moderate to marked hydronephrosis with dilated saloned renal pelvis outside the sinus kidney. So it is uh, important to differentiate also between the pelvirotal junction obstruction and hydronephrosis, which means dilatation of the collecting system proximal to the site of the obstruction, mostly associated with dilated part of ureter or even whole length of the ureter down to the plasma. And here is the a longitudinal grayscale ultrasonography of the right kidney, which uh, reveals a mild hydroerythronephrosis. Hydronephrosis may be due to intrinsic causes uh, of acquired nature as renal stones, nucleus, papillary necrosis, urethroceal, blood clot, neurogenic bladder, anticholinergics, pregnancy, or even pelvic inflammatory disease, diuretics, xycroteric flux, and diabetes and species. But intrinsic causes of congenital nature may be due to stenosis as urethral or urethral methyl uh, stenosis or a dynamic ureter, which is called mega ureter, spinal cord defects, duplication of the ureter, and ureter C. This diagram shows the causes of the hydronephrosis according to the anatomical site as the renal pelvis may be calculi, tumors, ureteropelvic junction obstruction, uh, at the ureteric uh, lens, may be intrinsic cause or extrinsic cause. If intrinsic, may be stones, tumor, clots, slough the papillary inflammation. Extrinsic causes may be pregnancy, tumor, retroperitoneal fibrosis. As a bladder, may be calculi, tumors, or functional as neurogenic bladder. As there is a posterior cell valve and the tumors, and as a prostatic hyperplasia, carcinoma, and prostatitis. Grades of hydronephrosis. This is normal kidney because the renal pyramids are separated by the normal renal parenchymal tissue, and there is no planting or dilatation of the calices, whatever minor or major calices. Okay. Once occur separation between the calices, as here, this is called a mild degree of the hydronephrosis. Moderate degree of hydronephrosis means the dilatation of the major and the minor calicial system plus separation of the calices. Severe degree of the hydronephrosis means marked dilatation of the renal pelvis with the thinning of the renal parenchyma. So according to the Society of the Fetal Urology, the grades of the hydronephrosis is classified into uh, no splitting of the renal sinus fat or even slight splitting, which is called grade one. Uh, if there is a splitting uh, and the urine fills the renal pelvis with or without major calicial dilatation, that is called grade 2. Grade 2 plus uniform dilatation of the minor calicial uh, system with preserved renal parenchyma called grade 3. And grade 4 means grade 3 plus parenchymal thinning, which means loss of the parenchymal thickness. Renal disorders, uh, we talk about it today, renal parenchymal disease, cystic renal disease, infective, and lastly, vascular renal disease. Diffuse renal parenchymal disease means that the normal size of the kidney with normal contour uh, may be due to the nephrocalcinosis or um, primary papillary and caliceal abnormality. If there is nephrocalcinosis, it may be medullary or cortical according to its position. If medullary, hypercalcemia, metabolic disorders like renal tubular acidosis, 
uh, structural abnormalities like metalloid sponge edema. If it is cortical uh, in location, like chronic glomerulonephritis, Alport syndrome, and acute cortical necrosis. Another entity, if there is primary papillary and or caliceal abnormalities, like in the renal papillary uh, necrosis, TP, and diabetes. So first, we will talk about the nephocalcinosis, which means the deposition of the calcium in the renal parenchyma related to the medullary pyramids and is frequently associated with medullary sponge kidney. In patients with disorder of calcium metabolism, likely hyperparathyroidism, and with, uh, it uh, appeared as regular arrangement of uh, hyperechoic pyramids, uh, numerous tiny and smaller than the pemoids. There is longitudinal scale, grayscale ultrasound of the right kidney, which uh, revealed multiple numerous okay, hyperechoic uh, shadows in the kidney. Uh, here is located in the medulla. When we talk about nephocalcinosis, should be differentiated from the renal stone, as the renal calculi are the more common finding on the ultrasound, may be asymptomatic or may cause hematuria. The common types of the renal stone, calcium stone, Shorvite stone, uric acid stone, and lastly, cystine stone. Stones appear the hyperechoic on the ultrasound, but with distal acoustic shadowing, uh, which is not present with nephocalcinosis, so it is important to differentiate between the nephocalcinosis and renal stone on the grayscale ultrasonography. Here is the staghorn stone, which filled the all pelvic calcial system and, ren and renal pelvis. Uh, on the plain X-ray, on the CT, and this is the diagram shows what is mean by uh, staghorn stone. Second, we have to talk about glomerulonephritis, which means inflammatory condition of which affects the glomeruli of the kidney, may be either acute glomerulonephritis or chronic glomerulonephritis. Patients may present in acute renal failure with oliguria or anuria, or with features of nephrotic syndrome, such as oedema, proteinuria, and hypoalpinemia. In the acute stage, the kidney may be slightly enlarged with changes in the echogenicity of the cortex may be preserved. So it means enlargement of the kidney without a change in the renal parenchyma. But in the chronic stage, the kidney shrink, become hyperechoic, loss of the cortical thickness, loss of the cortical medulloid differentiation, and this, this picture shows grayscale ultrasonography of the right kidney with chronic glomerulonephritic changes because it is a small size, it is a regular outline, loss of the parenchymal thickness, and there is a hyperechoic renal parenchyma. In relation to the liver, which is used as a caustic window on the right side. However, in acute tubular necrosis, which is a result of the ischemia and the lead to the acute renal failure, there is a rapid reduction of the kidney function and urine, but it is reversible if it is treated. The kidneys often appears normal in the acute tubular necrosis, but may be increased in the size, increased in the parenchymal echogenicity, increased in the cortical medulloid differentiation, and increased in the resistive index. So it means increase all parameters in the acute tubular necrosis. This is grayscale of the right kidney in the longitudinal scan, which revealed enlargement of the kidney with hyperechoic renal parenchyma and increased the cortical medulloid differentiation. In renal papillary necrosis, which occurs due to ischemia, causes of ischemia in uh, this entity menomic and the sporadic, okay? Sickle cell disease, pyelonephrites, obstruction, renal vein thrombosis, transplant rejection, analgesic nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, infection like TB, and lastly cirrhosis as in the chronic liver disease. Papillae, papillae tend to necrose and slough off, causing plumping of the calyces on the IVP. Papillary necrosis is difficult to be detected on the ultrasound unless in the advanced cases it appeared as a prominent calyces with increased cortical medulloid differentiation, as here. Here is a grayscale longitudinal scan of the kidney which revealed increased parenchymal echogenicity and sloughed the papillae, sloughed the papillae in this hypochoic area. But still, I view is the imaging method of choice in the renal papillary necrosis. Here is planting of the calyces, which 
means renal papillary necrosis in comparison to the left side with uh, the calyces here with preserved uh, cupping. TP in the kidney or tuberculosis in the kidney uh, traditionally described uh, as a limited role of the ultrasonography in the renal tuberculosis because of the mass lesions in the renal parenchyma of mixed echogenicity with or without necrotic area and calcifications. There is mucosal thickening and stenosis of the calyces. Also, there is mucosal thickening at the renal pelvis and ureter, ureteral structure and hydronephrosis. Lastly, plateau changes in the form of the mucosal thickening and reduced lil capacity. This is longitudinal scan of the right kidney, which revealed multiple hypoechoic uh, caseating area in the renal parenchyma, which coincides with the tuberculosis in the kidney. Okay. Uh, lastly, the kidney converted into is a calcific organ which is called putty kidney. Putty kidney or means autonephrectomy because of diffuse uniform extensive parenchymal calcifications forming a cluster of the kidney with autonephrectomy and this is the end stage of the genitourinary tuberculosis. In the diabetic nephropathy, in the early stage, the kidney enlarged with the normal echogenicity, but in the chronic stage, the kidney volume decreased with increased echogenicity, mainly associated with calcification. Here is a grayscale ultrasonography of the kidney in the early stage of the diabetic nephropathy, which uh, revealed the normal size and the normal echogenicity. Okay, maybe in a, some more or less enlarged in the size, but here in the chronic stage, the kidney appeared shrinkage in the size with increased parenchymal echogenicity. Uh, on the uh, power Doppler ultrasonography, there is an increased resistive index uh, more than 0.70. Cystic renal disease. Ultrasonography will visualize simple cysts as well as complicated cysts, adult polycystic kidney disease, multicystic dysplastic kidney, and hydrated cysts. The simple renal cyst is the most common renal mass, up to 50% of the population, and uh, their instance increasing with age. Far pelvic system must be differentiated from pelvic LCL dilatation or an extra renal pelvis because uh, it causes a filling defect on the IVP. Cyst can hemorrhage, causing pain. Large cyst, particularly of the lower pool, may be palpable. Renal cyst displays three basic characteristics. Uh, features on the ultrasonography, anechoic, thin, well-defined capsule, except posterior enhancement, hemorrhage or infection can give rise to the low-level echoes within the cyst. The capsule may display calcification. Here is the grayscale ultrasonography of uh, the uh, kidney with small cyst with a posterior enhancement. And uh, there, here is the cyst that contains some calcification. Cyst may be mistaken for hydronephrosis or for the aortic aneurysm, so it is important to diagnose it properly. Characteristic of the renal cyst, it may be single rather than multiple, may don't communicate with each other, uh, but hydronephrosis does. May be round or oval, it is free uh, of echogenicity because uh, so it appears anechoic, sharp interface between the mass and the renal tissue. Large renal cyst may be mistaken for the aortic aneurysm. But in the complicated renal cyst, we have to uh, comment on some uh, additional features like calcification, septations, immune nodules, or soft tissue. Uh, because according to the Posniac renal cyst classification, the simple cyst appeared anechoic, imperceptible wall, round shape, uh, needs no nothing. Posniac two cysts, minimally complex, uh, appeared single with thin septation and thin calcification, and also need nothing. Posniac two F cyst, it is minimally complex but needing a follow up because of thin septation, thin calcific calcification, and the hyper dense on the CT scan. Uh, so we have to be followed up uh, on ultrasonography or CT. Posniac three cyst, uh, Posniac three cyst, it is intermediate because of sick or multiple septation, mural nodule, hyperdense on the CT, and they need the partial nephrectomy 
lastly, Posniak 4 cyst, which is clearly malignant cyst because it contains a solid soft tissue mass, uh, may be enhancing with, uh, within the cyst and they need partial or total nephrectomy. This diagram shows Posniak 1 cyst, uh, which is a simple one, Posniak 2 sense septation, Posniak 2F with calcification and they need follow up. Posniak 3, 6 septation with mural nodule on the septation, so need partial nephrectomy. Posniak 4, there is enhancing soft tissue masses within the cyst, so need partial or total nephrectomy. Uh, but if uh, these cysts are diffused in the renal parenchyma, we will talk about the polycystic kidney disease or adult polycystic kidney disease. It is an autosomal dominant one, normally associated with progressive renal failure. In about 50% of cases, cysts are present in the liver, spleen, pancreas, ovary, and arachnoid cysts. It appeared on ultrasound uh, as multiple bilateral. Numerous cysts of variable size, not too connected to each other, not connected to the renal pelvis, may have a regular margin. Uh, there is often little or no demonstrable normal renal tissue in between. Some are sample, others are hemorrhagic and may contain stones inside. However, in the multicystic uh, dysplastic kidney, there is a congenital malformation of the kidney in which the renal tissue is completely replaced by cyst mostly unilateral, because if it is bilateral, it will be lethal. Occurs as a result of severe early renal obstruction during the development in the UTU. Obstructed calysis becomes plugged off, forming a numerous cyst which don't connect to each other. Here is a grayscale ultrasonography of the multicystic uh, uh, dysplastic kidney, which uh, showing multiple cysts not connected to each other, and there is no normal renal tissue in between. So this uh, case, if uh, we uh, proceed uh, on the diuretic renography or dense scan, it will show photopenic area at the, poly, um, at the site of the multicystic dysplastic kidney because there is no uptake by the tracer as it's not, con not containing normal renal tissue. Infective renal disease such as renal abscess, xanthogranulomatous spironephritis, and the hydrated cyst in the renal abscess, it is a progression of the focal inflammation within the kidney. It appeared as a complex mass with distal acoustic enhancement of ill-defined margin at first, then becomes more obvious. Increased echogenicity due to the low-level echoes from pus, but it may also be hypoechoic. Non-liquefied center, the abscess may be intrarenal, subcapsular, or even perineal. Here is grayscale longitudinal scan of the left kidney, which uh, showing there is focal abscess in the mid zone at the posterior surface of the mid zone of the left kidney of a hyperechoic uh, appearance and uh, some liquefaction inside. On the Bauer Doppler ultrasonography, there is no color in the renal abscess because it is a vascular lesion because of the inflammation. Second entity in the infective renal disease is a xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. And to diagnose it in the ultrasonography, we have a classic triad, which is called tier 4 sign. It consists of obstruction uh, by a stone, which may be fragmented, leading it with an enlargement, hydronephrotic, non-functioning kidney with fat globules. Um, Every entity has specific characters on the ultrasonography. There is enlargement of the kidney with hydronephrosis and the low level echoes inside because of the infection. And there is an obstructing the hyperechoic renal stones with posterior acoustic shadowing behind. Last entity in the infective group is hydrated cysts, which uh, caused by echinococcus parasite. Parasite form a cyst which has a second wall often with a smaller peripheral daughter cyst, frequently main cyst contains echoes, may contain floating membrane indicating impending rupture. This is a hydrated cyst, a larger cyst with multiple peripheral daughter cyst, and in uh, this case, uh, this is called floating membrane or water lily sign, which uh, means that impending rupture. 
Vascular renal disease, such as renal artery stenosis or renal vein thrombosis, AV fistula, and lastly, we will talk about the ultrasound in the dialysis patient. Renal artery stenosis mostly due to atherosclerotic disease or due to fibromuscular dysplasia of the arterial wall in the younger, generally female patient, cause hypertension and they may eventually cause renal failure as the site of stenosis and increase in the peak systolic velocity may be found greater than 1.5 up to 1.8 mL per second with post-stenotic circumference. This table shows direct and indirect signs of the renal artery stenosis. Direct signs at the site of the stenosis, which uh, consists of focal color aliasing, color POE, turbulence, peak systolic velocity more than 180 cm per second, renal aortic ratio more than 3.5. But indirect signs means acceleration time more than uh, point, uh, 0.07 per second and the acceleration index less than three minutes per second, and resistive index, uh, difference between resistive index between right and left side more than 5%. Here is a color doppler of the kidney with renal artery stenosis, which revealed that there is a low, uh, there is no sharp stool, it is low, okay? and it is uh, of more resistance, okay? And the resistive index here is less than uh, 70%. Here is, it is 50%. In the renal vein thrombosis, it is possible to see echopore thrombus within the dilated renal vein. Color Doppler confirm absence of the venous flow on perfusion within the kidney itself is reduced, highly pulsatile arterial waveform with reversed diastolic flow. If the thrombus produces total and sudden occlusion, the kidney becomes edematous and swollen within the first 24 hours. Eventually, it will shrink and become hyperechoic. Here, in the renal vein thrombus, there is echo free or uh, the renal vein, it is not uh, opacify on the color Doppler, is that it means there is a renal vein thrombus, and in the wave there is a reverse diastolic flow in the main renal artery, which means renal vein thrombus. Renal vascular malformation, localized vessel enlargement with turbulent, sometimes high velocity flow, may occur after renal biopsy. It appeared as a pool of the color flow is often present, as here, if bleeding is a clinical problem, embolization is the treatment of choice. In the Zodo aneurysm on the color Doppler, there is a yin yang pattern of the color Doppler, and on the pulse Doppler, there is through and the through wave form, which is characteristic for the renal vascular malformation. Patients with chronic renal failure may undergo either hemodialysis in which a subcutaneous AV shunt is created open in the wrist. So ultrasound used to assess the patency of the shunt or the catheter and they may identify localized area of infection which may be drained under ultrasound guidance if it is necessary. Lastly, we will talk about the renal transplantation which means heterotropic placed in addition to the native deceased kidney or after removal of one native kidney, positioned in the extra peritoneal space and uh, usually in the right side, anterior to the iliacus and psoas muscles. This is the kidney donor and this is the graft uh, artery and this is the graft vein and this is the ureter which is uh, connected to the blood. Renal transplant, uh, we have to assess morphological appearance as a pelvic cell dilatation, perrenal fluid collection. Also by the Bauer Doppler and color Doppler, we have uh, uh, to comment on the spectral Doppler waveforms and the nature of the renal artery, renal vein, uh, or even AV malformations as we described before. In the intervention, uh, we use the ultrasonography as uh, in the guide biopsy procedures to drain fluid collections in the placement of the nephrostomy tube. Morphological appearance 
of the renal transplant. It appears as uh, the echogenicity of the cortex, medulla, and renal sinus, and corticomedullary differentiation. Size change in the renal size may be significant in the transplant organs. It is useful to calculate the renal volume, circumference, or L surface area, pelvic cell dilatation, and degree of the hydronephrosis. Vascular anatomy, if there is global perfusion, can be assessed with color Doppler. The normal spectral Doppler reform is a low resistance reform with continuous forward uh, and diastolic flow. Also, we have to comment on the perrenal fluid as a common complication either resolve spontaneously or need drainage. This is grayscale longitudinal scan of the renal transplant. This is by the power Doppler. Uh, which revealed the good perfusion of the uh, graft up to the cortex. This is color doubler of the intrarenal vessels and at the renal hilum, which revealed the patency of the main graft artery and the graft vein. Spectral analysis of the waves revealed the normal triphasic arterial waveform of the intrarenal vasculatures, which means a normal graft vessel. Also, we use the ultrasound in the post-transplant complication assessment, which is divided into three main categories according to immediate post-operative complication, primary, secondary, renal dysfunction. If it is immediate, there may be non-perfusion of the graft, normally the result of an occluded or twisted renal artery. And here, we need the surgical correction or hematoma. Primary dysfunction is non-perfusion, arterial occlusion, total or low part, acute tubular necrosis as described above, renal vein thrombosis as described before, obstruction, acute or accelerated acute rejection. Secondary dysfunction, which may be due to acute rejection, cyclosporin, acute tubular necrosis, obstruction, renal artery stenosis, post biopsy fistula infection, or even chronic rejection. Renal transplant rejection may be acute or chronic. If it is acute, it will lead to delayed graft function. Uh, in the acute phase, it appeared on the ultrasonography as enlargement of the kidney due to the edema, increased the echogenicity, increased the corticomodulary differentiation with prominent renal permits, and decreased the little fat in the renal sinus, which leading to the splitting of the pelvic cell system. Here is a grayscale ultrasonography of the renal transplant in the acute rejection phase. The kidney appeared swollen because of increased size with increased little parenchymal echogenicity and the prominent pyramid and also increased the corticomodulary differentiation. In the chronic phase, gradual deterioration in the renal function that may be appearing any time uh, after three months of the transplantation, it appeared increase in the echogenicity of the kidney with the reduced the little corticomedullary differentiation. Kidney will shrink. The Doppler resistance in the um, uh, Doppler resistance indices are increased in the rejection, but this finding is not specific. So in the chronic renal rejection, here as the kidney appear more or less of the normal size, but with uh, increased little echogenicity and decrease the corticomedullary differentiation. And on the uh, Doppler ultrasonography, it appeared to increase the resistive index, but uh, it is not specific for the uh, chronic transplant rejection. Causes of the renal transplant rejection, uh, if it is acute, it appear, uh, it, it doesn't occur in the first uh, 48 hours. Uh, acute tubular necrosis always occurs in the first 48 hours. Obstruction has a relatively slight increase in the resistive index and is uh, associated with pelvic cell system dilatation. If the cyclosporin toxicity has to be prolonged and severe, affect the endodiastolic flu and the blood levels. If the renal vein thrombosis, it is a late complication of the renal transplant, has a characteristic reversible endodiastolic flu. Pattern. The artery has a low velocity systolic peak in the early stage, no venous flow identified. If there is perirenal fluid collection, there is a compression of the kidney causes an increase in the intrarenal pressure. Procedure application of the ultrasonography and the transplant biopsy. 
uh, or in the kidney in the kidney biopsy in the kidney biopsy we will place the patient in the prone position and the, here is the kidney uh, here is the ultrasound probe here is the uh, biopsy needle this is a cross sectional image showing that the needle will indent the posterior surface of the kidney in the retroperitoneal space to take a biopsy from the right kidney as shown here So we use the ultrasonography in the percutaneous renal biopsy, in the castor placement in the hemodialysis patient, in the drainage of the collection and cyst aspiration. If uh, uh, there is percutaneous kidney biopsy uh, from the native kidney, the entry size, angle, and depth can be determined with ultrasound, after which the needle is placed without direct ultrasound guidance. Ultrasound marking or ultrasound can be used during the needle insertion, which is called real-time guidance. Uh, here is the uh, native kidney and there is the ultrasound proof. Uh, we will mark here and then we will uh, introduce the needle of the pipes. Lastly, we have to take in our minds that the ultrasound is an adjacent in an evaluation of patients with suspected renal colic uh, because of evaluation post kidneys, evaluation aorta, and scan post kidney. Thank you. Any questions about um, ultrasound appearance of uh, any entity we have talked about? So at the end of the presentation, I'd like to thank Dr. Dua Sharaf for this excellent presentation. It's an excellent. You didn't leave anything. Uh, you covered all the aspects of ultrasound in nephrology. Examination, Doppler, diseases, intervention nephrology. So uh, I would like to conclude to congratulate you for this excellent presentation. And now we will have some questions from the audience. Like you see here, was meant by acoustic window in the grayscale. Uh, we, we have uh, to use a uh, uh, landmark for us to comment on the renal ecogenicity because it will differ from one person to another. So uh, the landmark also is different from one person to another, but it is the same organ. Uh, which is right on the uh, on the right side is the liver on the left side is the spleen so we will compare between the ecogenicity of the renal kidney and the liver if it is the same it is a normal if it is hyper than parenchyma of the liver on the right side it means deceased the renal parenchyma uh, so we will search for the cause of the parenchymal disease as we discussed before the second question from the dr muhammad abdul salam uh, LS right uh, in mid axillary, left kidney post axillary right. So, what and subcostal mid clavicular line for? Do you understand uh, this? Yeah, this I uh, understand. He uh, longitudinal scan of the right kidney done in the mid axillary line because it is anterior placement of the right kidney. Uh, but the left kidney it, uh, done, it is done in the posterior axillary line because it is posterior placement of the left kidney, posterior to the stomach, posterior to the spleen, inferior to the spleen. So we have to do more posterior procedure to uh, the comment on the left kidney. Uh, excellent. So the coming question to why in case of diabetic nephropathy, kidney maintains normal size and shape even in advanced stages like in the stage kidney disease. I think the, the, the answer is easy because uh, uh, the diabetes is one of the metabolic disorders that is uh, normally is associated with large kidneys. So when the kidney size is reduced, it reduces to normal size. So this is why in patients with chronic kidney disease, due to, due to diabetes, we will find a normal size kidney. So this is because the kidney in, in early diabetes is large kidney. And this is the histological marks. We have glomerulomegaly and large kidneys. And then the kidney, when it starts to shrink, it will be reduced to normal size before reaching a small size like uh, the other causes of chronic kidney disease. Uh, Am I right? Uh, yes. If you don't mind, can I ask 
can I uh, yes, add uh, agree, another, another explanation? Because the pathology in the renal uh, uh, diabetic nephropathy uh, mainly due to microangiopathy. Microangiopathy as the vasculatures of the kidney, not in the parenchyma, not in the size of the parenchyma, but uh, more or less related to the vasculatures of the kidney. But, but uh, Dr. Adua, uh, 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 the, the, this answer is in the early beginning. Yes. The, but at the end of the day, with diabetic end kidney disease, yes. all the brain chemo are affected. Sure. The brain, the glomeruli, the glomerulostitium, and the blood vessels. Sure. So this is the, the question is why in end kidney there is a, a relatively normal size kidney? This is because the kidney in the starting point is large kidneys. This is the most. Yes. Uh, yes visible explanation. The other, some radio, uh, radiologists mention bilateral multiple renal cysts. How to know it is BCKD, polycystic kidney or not? It is uh, very easy to diagnose the uh, adult polycystic kidney disease. We have some criteria we comment on it. Uh, first, large kidney, more than the normal size. Second, multiple numerous variable sizes is it not connected to each other or not connected to the renal pelvis and should have normal renal parenchyma in between cysts, okay? Because if the absence of the renal parenchyma, we will uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, will he differ uh, according to the presence or absence of the renal parenchyma from other polycystic kidney to the multi-cystic dysplastic kidney, which uh, means there is no normal kidney tissue in between. And I want to add a point because when I started my residency since a long time, I expected at that time that for to say polycystic kidney, the kidney should be full of cysts. No, nowadays there is the criteria according to the age of the patient. So for our dealing with a young patient who may have even three cysts in each kidney, it is enough with the presence of family history of polycystic kidney disease if the age is below 40 years. So we have ultrasound the positive criteria and the ultrasound exclusion criteria for polycystic kidney disease it's not necessarily to find the kidney is full of cysts we should be aware of that uh, i am a junior radiology resident some on my seniors call the stones as gravels and the others call the small or tiny stones not gravels what is correct it is um, uh, objective Objective, uh, so when we say when we say gravel, not stone. No, uh, there is a difference between gravels and stones. Yes. Gravels have no posterior pelvic shadowing because it is very small uh, for the uh, pain lens to be detected on by the crystals on the ultrasound probe. But uh, stones, uh, it is a sizable one yes. uh, with posterior pelvic shadowing uh, because it's a very uh, sizable one, so it has uh, detected by the uh, crystals on the ultrasound probe. I think if we have suspicion, uh, we should resort to the gold standard test for uh, stones, which is spiral CT without contrast. And we may use the uh, low, low radiation CT. Uh, what does it mean by posterior enhancement? Uh, there's a difference between the posterior enhancement in the anechoic cyst, which uh, reveals a uh, hypoechoic shadowing behind the wall of the cyst, which appears uh, in principle a high, uh, hypoechoic with posterior uh, enhancement. But in the stone, it's uh, called the posterior atelic shadowing because the stone appears hypoechoic with posterior, uh, more or less, uh, in gray uh, shadowing behind. Dr. Hani has a question. Dr. Hani? Dr. Hani. Dr. Han. Hani. Amani? Yes. Dr. Hani. Okay. okay. My question is uh, for, uh, thank you, Doctor, for your lecture. It was amazing. And uh, I would like to ask two questions. First, how to calculate the renal bladder volume? Okay. Because uh, in my place of work, we are using. Uh, small portable ultrasound called the V-scan. And um, I can, with longitudinal axis, I can see the length and the, the width. I cannot do more than this. I do not know how to calculate the, the urine volume according to the, um, the formula. You give us uh, a formula uh, 
to explain exactly how to calculate the urine volume in general bladder. This first question. Second question is so the question by, is uh, uh, how, how how to calculate the urine volume in the urinary bladder in case of acute urinary, uh, urinary retention. Okay, and the second question is uh, what does it mean resistive index? I didn't understand how, how can you interpret it that like resistive index. Yes, is how it's, okay. if it's high means what, if it's low means what. That's okay, all. do you have you. Uh, other questions? No, 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 thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Hani, for your question, and Dr. Dua now will take uh, over. So how to calculate urine volume? I think you, you mentioned it clearly, uh, uh, just to repeat it. But he asked about uh, calculation of the urine volume in case of urine retention. Okay. So in cases of urine retention, uh, some uh, doctors prefer to uh, introduce the uh, urine cell capture and uh, then also calculate the residual uh, uh, urine uh, in the bladder, but it's not accurate method because uh, it's uh, not uh, accurate method of evacuation of the bladder. Uh, so um, I think the post uh, volume uh, I, Excuse me, Dr. Dua. I think to uh, estimate the volume of urinary bladder in the in the presence of retention, I After think it is, the patient to it, it, not, it is not, not to evacuate. I think from my mind, I can, yes. you can correct me. Mm -hmm. It has no practical and no clinical value because I need from the ultrasound examination in case of retention to to say there is dilated pelvis, dilated ureter, and not only just full bladder. Uh, it is important in cases of uh, lower urinary tract obstruction, yes. uh, infrabladder uh, causes as uh, prostatic hyperplasia or uh, prostatic tumors, uh, or even in cases of the urethral uh, metal stenosis. Uh, these cases may lead to the uh, lower urinary tract obstruction. Do you have here from the urology side any request to estimate the volume of urinary bladder in the presence of retention? No. No, because it is it has no clinical value. Yeah. And as a, as a nephrologist or even a urologist, I want to know if there is ureter dilatation, pelvis dilatation. This means that the urinary tract is full of urine. So in this scenario, even I cannot evacuate it rapidly because of barotrauma. So I think the value of urinary volume estimation is in the if I wanted to know the residual uh, urine volume after micturition rather than the absolute volume with the presence of retention. Yes. So, so this is, a, the, the, uh, I think a resistive index is simple. Resistive question. index, uh, uh, it's uh, also calculated by uh, another term, which uh, uh, consists of uh, end diastolic volume uh, minus uh, peak systolic volume uh, 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 um, uh, divided, divided by uh, end diastolic volume. Uh, so we have, in the, the, as Dr. Dua mentioned within the presentation, the flow within the kidney intrarenal is biphasic. So we have systolic and diastolic. So we measure the velocity of systolic and the, and the velocity at the end of diastolic. So we have S, this is the velocity of systolic, and D, the velocity at the end of diastolic. The equation of resistive index is S minus D divided by S. Uh, and uh, as nephrologists, we respect the resistive index in many scenarios, but it is not absolute because many causes are there that is associated with high resistive index, like, for example, in transplantation rejection, balloonephritis, drug toxicity, and even if the operator compresses the kidney by the probe, we may find high resistive index. On the other hand, Low resistive index, as shown clearly and elegantly by Dr. Dua, can help us to uh, think of renal artery stenosis because yes. renal artery stenosis is associated with low resistive index, and as well as the fistula, urinary fistula, renal fistula is associated with low resistive index. But the morphology of the wave is different in, uh, in the case of artery stenosis from the fistula, so yes. it is easy to calculate resistive index. Um, it is calculated uh, on, uh, on the screen, uh, screen automatically. Yes, yes. Uh, sometimes we uh, do a Doppler ultrasound at the time of discharge of uh, renal transplant patient from the hospital, and the resistive index at the end, the basal resistive index, yes. is one of the prognostic markers that can be associated with graft outcome. And I think the rest, the rest of questions 
are uh, congratulating Dr. Dua for excellent presentation. Hope, uh, it, was, uh, it was a very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, the last one, may I ask what is the significance between resistive index and the volatility index? Uh, when to use volatility or it is not needed? This is the last question. Uh, uh, no, volatile index is not needed in uh, conditions we talk about it in the nephrology. We uh, only use resistive index. Resistive index means, uh, as uh, Dr. Hussein said, uh, that uh, if it is increased resistive index in some cases and decreased resistive index in another, it is diagnostic and no need for volatile index. So, Dr. Tariq Zayan, do you have any questions? Dr. Tariq? Okay, so we have no questions. So at the end, thank you very much, Dr. Dua, for this excellent presentation. It is a really wonderful and impressive presentation. Thank you.